a lot of our product design discussions sound like science fiction. As soon as you're doing anything with neuroscience, you're like, you know, it's indistinguishable from, from science fiction now. Our ability to create experience in people's brains that are not mediated through their meat peripherals will actually be better than uh, is possible. Like, so you're used to experiencing the world through eyes, but eyes were created by this low cost bidder who didn't care about failure rates and, and RMAs, and if it got broken, there was no way to repair anything effectively. So, you know, it's like, totally makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, but is not at all, you know, reflective of consumer preferences. So the visual experience, the visual fidelity will be able to create through, you know, the real world will stop being the metric that we apply to the best possible uh, visual fidelity. And instead it's like, the real world will seem flat, colorless, um, blurry compared to the experiences that you'll be able to create in people's brains. So that's sort of like a simple way in which I think most, you know, it's like the matrix said, oh, and we'll create something that's like reality. And I think with BCIs, n fairly quickly, we'll be able to create experiences that are superior to what. But that's not where it gets weird. Where it gets weird is when who you are becomes editable through a BCI, right? So like, oh, I'm feeling unmotivated today. Right now we think that that's like this fundamental personality characteristic that is relatively intractable to change. And instead it'd be like, oh, I'm gonna just turn up my focus right now. I'm gonna, imp my mood should be this. Once you can start editing, you start having these feed forward and feedback loops in terms of who you want to be, which is a weird thing to talk about. Right? I think it's an inevitable consequence of what I see happening with BCI, but it's, we don't, I don't even have the terminology yet to explain what the problem is concisely. You just heard me go for a couple of minutes trying to sort of circle around this description, which at some point will be, oh, well, it's just a simple math equation that you can use to talk about the choices that the people will, make, will, will be making in terms of who they decide to be when they're, when who they are is an editable thing. And then, I think you'll end up in situations where the kinds of experiences that you have will be ch complicated choices that you make. Right now, we know the, th the things that we like, but with BCI and with what's coming in terms of neuroscience, the, th the experiences that you have will now be things that are created and edited for you. Like one of the early applications I expect we'll see is improved sl sleep, right? It's like sleep will now become an app that you run where you're gonna like, oh, I need this much sleep, I need this much REM, and but it's now, you know, rather than, you know, I'll fluff my pillows this way and I'll like, you know, take, you know, Zolpidem to try to get myself to go to sleep. It's like, oh, I just say, this is how I wanna sleep right now. And it, it looks like an app running on your phone rather than this complicated thing. And most people will look at that and go, that sounds pretty nice. You I mean, I got on this 12 hour plane and I basically said, I, want, I did not want to be awake for the next 12 hours and I wake up completely refreshed with my circadian rhythm. People say, okay, this other stuff sounds scary. That, my friends have all done it and they've all told me it works well. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and, and try that. So the problem that I have right now is picking which application you want to do, but there are tractable applications that you can tackle right now. Like if you look at VR headsets, any VR headset manufacturer who's not at least getting up to speed on these technologies and figuring out how they could apply them. Like uh, we're working on an open source project so everybody can have high resolution read technologies built into headsets uh, in, a, in a bunch of different modalities. And that's like if you're a software developer in 2022 who doesn't have one of these in your test lab, you're making a silly mistake, right? So I think software development for for interactive experiences, absolutely you'll, you'll be using one of these um, modified VR heads, head straps uh, to be doing that routinely, simply because it's, there's just too much useful data. Right now, it's more of a certification issue than it is a, a, a scientific issue to, to suppress vestibular cochlear-based vertigo on VR headsets. Uh, so it's going to be like this thing where these applications will come online and it's the problem that I have is when do you stop and productize one as opposed to keep learning the, the technology because the rate at which we're learning stuff is so fast that you just like you, you don't want to sort of prematurely say okay let's just lock everything down and build a product and go through all the approval processes when six months from now we'd have something that did 
you know, enabled a bunch of other other uh, features. So the open source um, Headstrap one is is sort of a way for us to say we need to get something out there where we're not trying to create consumer value, we're trying to get a bunch of other software developers a platform so they can start thinking about these issues so that as the, the, the second generation and third generation of these technologies come online, they're already saying, oh, what I really want was you've got, if you could just improve the spatial accuracy of this by even a little bit, then there are a new class of applications. You're like, you're right on the edge of being useful, but we need the improved spatial accuracy in terms of localizing what's happening in some region of somebody's brain. Once you start thinking about brain-computer interfaces, you'd say, oh, how can we create a hand? So, like some of the projects you're working at, that we're involved with right now are related to creating synthetic hands for people who don't actually have hands, right? So it turns out game engines are really useful because they simulate a lot of the information that you would need in order to create a simulated um, uh, hand for somebody. And so the question, as soon as you do that, you say, oh, can we give people a tentacle? And you think, oh, brains were never designed to have tentacles. But it turns out brains are really flexible. Your body's ability to incorporate new things into it has to be flexible, you know, because you use tools and you want to use the end of the tool as if it's part of your body. And you, in fact, if you look at the parts of people's brains that light up, it's exactly the same. Uh, you can make people think they hurt by injuring their tool, uh, which is a complicated topic in and of itself. Um, and uh, so it's probably going to be a lot easier for people to have these extraneous limbs uh, and it's just a question of how hard we can push it before we need to have medication augmented neuroplasticity. Just the built-in neuroplasticity that people have. Like I've had a bunch of uh, surgery on my eyes and some of those surgeries have been fairly dramatic in terms of um, the change uh, my color perception. So my left and right eye sees very different colors than one of the eyes did previously and then they do to each other. But it never occurred to me that they did until I had the surgery, which perturbed that relationship. And there's this phenomenon where things in my medial plane uh, were changing. Like I would see two objects because my left eye saw an object, my right eye saw an object. They were different colors and until it took about two weeks before my brain wasn't sort of randomly making another object appear in this medial plane between my, my two eyes. So you talk to your doctor and he's like, ah, fine, don't worry about it, it'll go away. But the fact that it goes away is just an indication of how ready, how much my, my humanness has to adapt. Like right now, my humanness is adapting to my eye suddenly changing, right? Um, for a lot of people, it's gonna sound like, oh, this sounds scary and very different without realizing just how much who they are in these sort of basic perceptual motor kinds of functions already is, uh, is, is flexible. So somebody who's, who's, who's lost their physical limbs, what you wanna do is go and build a virtual limb. And so Valve or any game developer, I mean, Epic would be able to do the same thing. Unity would be able to do the same thing. Is you just solve a bunch of problems for, for those scientists. Like you show up and say, hey, we'll create a simulated physical environment. Like we, ha we know what a bone is, right? We animate bones. We'll do all of the calculations so that your patient who uh, is trying to where you're, you're building a brain computer face, where they're eventually going to be connected to a robot or or what you know, or have a replacement prosthetic, um, uh, but you can iterate software a lot faster than you can iterate a, a prosthetic. So we give them a framework in which they can do research and work with 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 patients. Right? Obviously, Valve is not in the business of creating virtual prosthetics for people. You know, we're going to be much more focused on this. But it's sort of like this is what we're contributing to this particular research project, and because of that, we get to have access to you know, leaders in the neuroscience field who teach us a lot about the neuroscience side. There's nothing magical about these systems that make them uh, less vulnerable to, you know, viruses or, or things like that than other computer systems. And the people who are building it, you know, it's like, right now you have to trust all of your financial data, all of your personal information to, to your technology infrastructure. And if the people who build those systems do a bad job of it, they'll, you know, 
it'll drive consumer acceptance off a cliff and you know nobody wants to say oh you know remember Bob remember when Bob got hacked by the Russian malware yeah that sucked is he still running naked through the forests you know or whatever uh, so yeah uh, no people are gonna have to have a lot of confidence that these are secure systems that don't have long-term health risks. People are gonna decide for themselves whether they want to do it. Like, nobody makes people use a phone, right? Everybody's used to, though, that their social identity has evolved, right? You know, there are a lot of people whose sense of who they are in their world in relationship to other people is affected by their Facebook page or their Instagram page or, you know, what they're posting on Slack or whatever the internal, you know, messaging tool that they're using at their newspaper. Um, uh, but you don't have to do it. You don't have to have a phone. It's just that a lot of people, now that phones are out there, like a lot of people hated having phones. You know, people in my generation did not like the fact, they were like, oh my God, the office is following me everywhere. This is horrible. I can never be off work. You know, but a lot of people nowadays are like, yeah, I like having my phone. Like having my phone on a bus is great. I'd really not want to give that up. And uh, so I think people, I'm not saying everybody's going to love and insist that they have a brain computer interface. I'm just saying each person is gonna decide for themselves whether or not there's an interesting combination of features, functionality, price. I mean, the first time I heard about LASIK was, in, was bonkers. It's like, let me get this straight. You're going to burn my eyes with lasers and I'm gonna pay you money to do it, right? And it's like, okay, well, that's, that's never gonna happen. And nowadays it's like everybody has this understanding, of course you're gonna get LASIK. It's like everybody who's, nobody who's done it has come back and said, this was a horrible bad idea. Uh, and now it's cheap enough and safe enough and enough people are telling me it's, uh, it's a reasonable thing to do. So I think they'll follow a similar kind of pathway. But there's not gonna be A, B, C, I. There are gonna be a whole bunch of applications that are dependent upon a series of read and write technologies and, the, and a set of applications that build on top of it.